from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Eleanor Oldroyd in London where we woke up to another frosty morning. But the good news is it's March the Northern Hemisphere spring is on the horizon and with England finishing their test series against New Zealand, what is out there is a summer of test cricket. So that's my little bit of positivity on a cold London morning. Oh, Ellie, you're fantastic. Gee, I think you're swelled, didn't someone say a few years ago? <laughs> my little friend just wandered in while I was talking here and uh, I'm going to have a a brief self-indulgence to tell you that um, Rusty, who's an adolescent puppy at uh, 14 months, has been a bit naughty. Uh, I got a brand new passport the other day in readiness for the uh, excitement of going away. And um, within two days, he'd managed to eat a good portion of it. And I took uh, this rather doggy passport into the office and the chap said, um, no. It looks all right on the main pages, but you'll have to get another one. I honestly thought that happened just in the movies or in the books. Dog eats passport. But, you know, I hope you get your passport soon, Jim. Hello, this is Charu Sharma for All India Radio in Bangalore once again. Just another couple of days before I disappear into the Himalayas for a trek. Nothing desperate. It's with uh, old school mates of mine, so everybody's sort of a little oldish on the trek. And nothing at all as difficult as trying to bat for long on the pitches that India are offering for the India-Australia series. Charo, Jim, it's great to see you both. Thank you for being with me on Stumped. Um, first on the programme today, Australia have done it again. They have won the Women's T20 World Cup for the sixth time. They were pushed harder than ever before with a narrow win against India in the semi-final. And they saw off a brave South Africa in the final in front of a record attendance for a women's match in South Africa. The host's first appearance in a World Cup final, men's or women's, certainly seems to have captured the nation's attention. But in the end, Jim, they came up against an Australia side who are potentially the most dominant team in all of world sport. Well, they say the the strength of any side that plays like Australia's been playing is is to have that versatility and depth. So they really bat down to about nine. They've got lots of options with the ball and they feel pretty well uh, alongside that. And despite, as I keep mentioning, the uh, fickleness of T20 cricket, there's always a game that you can lose. And they very nearly lost uh, to India had it not been for that run out where Kaur got a bat stuck, um, they probably would have lost. So uh, Australia's record, unbelievable, really. Six of the last seven T20 um, World Cups, something like 13 white ball wins in major competition. The interesting thing around that is that they do not get the recognition globally that I think they deserve. I mean, if you look at something like the Laureus Awards and the nominations, uh, not only for teams but for for players, uh, the women's team in Australia do not feature at all. Whereas historically, if you go back to the days when Australia were winning a, a lot of test matches, uh, and Brett Lee, for instance, was one player on the rise. He was nominated. The Australian cricket team was nominated, but the women's cricket's not considered, obviously, at this point, uh, to be as strong as uh, the men's game. Rusty is agreeing with you every word there, Jim, uh, isn't he? He's, just, he's backing you up 100%. At the same time, Charo, as, as Jim says, it was really close, wasn't it, in that, that uh, semi-final against India? Um, just a bit of Paul Fielding really let, let India down perhaps. But do you feel like the landscape is changing for women's cricket in India as well, particularly with the WPL coming up? Without question. I was just like uh, all of you have been mentioning that the the landscape should be changing for South Africa as well, which of course is a very sporting nation. But for women in India, there are many other secondary problems which they have to somehow get past and then take on to a sporting life. But just back to that match, yes, you are right. I, I do think India were winning. Uh, they, were in a very, they were in a winning position. Uh, Alyssa Healy, I think, did mention that, you know, I don't think luck has anything to do with it because Harman Preet kept talking about luck. And it was a question of lazy running at that point of time. But I would like to suggest that, uh, as we all know, quite famously, the bat did get stuck in the soil just inches away from the line and almost her entire body was over. So it wasn't quite lazy running. I think she, you know, is smart enough and uh, is experienced enough to know that the second was on and she took it. 
And if the bat hadn't got stuck, she was in such great form at that point of time that India would have won against Australia. And mind you, if Australia has lost uh, in the last, what, dozen years or half a dozen years, it has been to India. So, um, well, you never know. Things could have been very different and the Indians could have actually won their first ever ICC trophy, which is something that's obviously missing and hurting. But despite that, uh, I think the Indian girls uh, have gotten over their disappointment and they have so much more, as we all know, to look forward to now. Well, next on Stumped, we're going to talk about one of the greatest ever finishes to a test match. England began day five of the second test against New Zealand in Wellington, needing 210 runs to seal the series. Joe Root's 95 put them in the driving seat, but when Ben Folkes lost his wicket for 35, it was left to England's numbers 10 and 11, Jack Leach and Jimmy Anderson, to try and get the last seven runs. A single from Leach... A four from Anderson took England within two of victory, but then Anderson edged a Neil Wagner delivery behind. It was taken by Tom Blundell and New Zealand won by one run. Such a narrow margin of victory has only happened once before in the history of Test cricket. That was West Indies against Australia in 1993, which I'm guessing, Jim, you you may well remember yourself. But in, in terms of what happened at the Basin Reserve this week, it was an amazing test match over the five days. Well, if you want to look at something, there's two one-run margins. There's one two-run margin uh, that Australia was involved in. You might remember at Edgbaston. Now, all three of them were down the leg side, caught behind. Craig McDermott, I think, was caught off the glove. No one reviewed Mm -hmm. it in those days. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do it. Uh, From Courtney Walsh, with two needed to win. Caught behind. Of course, Michael Kastrovich, did he have his hand on the bat or not when he was caught down the leg side? Uh, again, there was no DRS. If there had been, it could have ruined one of the, the fa- famous finishes in, in Test history. But poor old Jimmy Anderson sent out there at 40 years of age to try and win the game when his batsman had failed so dismally. What I loved about that afternoon of theatre uh, was Neil Wagner. Now, Neil, Neil Wagner, uh, just recently, has been a bit of a villain in New Zealand cricket because he keeps bumping people out or trying to, but he got thumped by Harry Brook and Root. But on this occasion, when the game was on on the up, um, he was able to produce some bounces that got wickets. He got Stokes out, Root out. He took a couple of catches himself down there at fine leg. And so he was the archetypal match winner. Uh, at the crunch, even though at times you were thinking, does he know there are three stumps down there? He's allowed to bowl at them, <laughs> and he kept banging the thing in. Anyway, it was thr- it was thrilling stuff. It was it was great from New Zealand's point of view, with Kane Williamson's exemplary second inning century uh, alongside Blundell that they got back into the game when they looked looked like uh, they were going to go down by an innings after being asked to follow on. The interesting thing about this game was that I'm sure if it was an Ashes match, it wouldn't have been a follow-on. And I'll tell you one of the main reasons why there wouldn't have been a follow-on is because Broad and Anderson, as good as they are, are getting old. Um, And it showed in the second innings when they had to back up and bowl again uh, on a pitch that got a little bit easier to bat on, and New Zealand's batting was very good, of course, but there just wasn't quite the edge in the bowling uh, that there might have been if they'd had their feet up for a couple of hours while England batted again. So I doubt if it, despite the baseball attitude to taking the game on and the rest of it, uh, I doubt if it would happen in an Ashes match. But mm. but there it is. Thank, thank goodness it did because it produced uh, one of the best finishes you'd, you'd ever want to see. True. But this is the great thing about Test cricket. It can completely defy expectations. And particularly when it comes to this, Charu, there was the the run out of Harry Brook without facing a ball. You know, England's new batting superstar. But I mean, what do you make of this this England style? I think the whole world, uh, certainly fans in England, are are now very appreciative of England's new style. I, I, I must confess, I'm all for it. Because England uh, uh, in the past, and I, I don't mean any major disrespect here, uh, were a little staid and, and old-fashioned in their cricket. And a lot of people, well, I mean, then criticize it. Perhaps that, that exemplified what test matches were all about. But they've done a 180. And this whole baseball thing is very exciting. And, of course, they've won much more than they've lost. So at this point of time, you'll have to say that it's working, not just for England. And sure, they lost this by one run. But like I said, the fans are probably more 
um, uh, accepting and appreciative of the style of cricket and, and especially the new fans because they could use this kind of um, robust urgency in, in, in cricket. Uh, and, and I do think that we're not giving the England bowlers enough uh, uh, appreciation here because, yes, it's all about the batsman trying to score quickly and, and racing towards win. But ultimately, as we've all been saying for years in, in cricket, it's the bowlers who win new test matches by taking 20 wickets. So that's also a big feature for England because the bowlers are supporting uh, the baseball style in terms of batting. And, uh, and I do think that uh, what happened in this test match and the way England are playing their test uh, match cricket is not only good for England, it's great for test match cricket because test match cricket, as we all know, could use a uh, slightly higher level of excitement, particularly for the newer fans who must come into the game. Finally on Stumped, take a moment to think of sports stars from Spain. Your mind might go to Rafael Nadal in tennis, uh, Xavi and Iniesta in football or Fernando Alonso in Formula One. And cricket is unlikely to come into your mind at all. But this week, Spain's cricket players earned a place in the record books. They bowled the Isle of Man out for just 10 runs, the lowest total in a men's T20 match ever. And I'm delighted to say that Spain's head coach, Corey Rutgers, joined us, joins us on the stump now. Corey, hello. Um, just, just give us a little bit of a background to this game, first of all. Why were you playing the Isle of Man? And, and did you always expect to win this? Uh, well, yeah, we did expect to win, but maybe not like this. Uh, and good morning, everyone, as well. Um, yeah, for us, we've got a big project going on with Spanish cricket at the moment. We've got a lot of good facilities. We've got turf wickets all over the country, and it's a, a good, growing club base. Um, and for us, we've got an eye on the 50-over Challenge League and trying to get up the rankings. So I think in November period, um, I got in touch with Isle of Man, who are ranked 39th in the world. We're currently ranked 36th. And just with the idea of six T20Is, see how we go, um, and play a little bit more cricket. We're very lucky in this country that there's 11 months of sun. So a February series sounded like a very good concept to everybody. And as the wickets were, were tumbling, what was going through your head? Uh, this was, yeah, so the, when it got to the final game, this got a little bit, it got a little bit crazy, to be honest. I still can't really surmise it because... Obviously, at this associate level, you really compact your series. So we were playing two T20s a day. And in the morning, I'll just go a little bit before that. In the morning, they hit us for 134. We did chase it down and just a normal game of T20, chased it down in about 14 overs. It gets into the afternoon session. We have a big group meeting. We have some lunch. And I always like the stories before the story. About an hour leading into the game, my two premium left-arm seam bowlers were exhausted. One had shin splints. So, uh, shin splints, I should say. One has a knee injury, and they both said, "Corey, please, I need rest." So I put my arm around them. Come, come on, guys, push one more for cricket, Espania. Um, we win the toss. They say, "Okay, coach, I'm good to go." We win the toss and bowl first. Um, it's a nice sunny day, bit of a breeze across the ground. The wicket's been playing well the whole tournament, um, and it just it just happened so quickly. I think the very first ball of the game, the glove down the leg side, and it's a good take by the keeper, one for none. The second over, one gets through the gate, really good in swing, late to swinging delivery. It's two for four. And then it started to get a bit weird in the third mm -hmm. over. I think Mohamed Kamran, who's um, got first class experience in Pakistan and he's been in Spain for 10 years now, and he's quick. He's still genuinely quick. He gets three perfect Yorkers right, um, gets himself an international hat trick. And at this stage, when it's five for five, okay, this is where you're thinking, well, the game's probably already won. But I was just waiting. I was waiting for the the leg buys that will go for four or the edges or someone. I've been in collapses myself as a player. You're always expecting one person to click. And then I think in the fourth over, we picked up two more. And at seven for five, that's when it really started to hit home. Something completely out of this world is happening. Um, and then to their credit, Isle of Man, to their credit, they stuck it through a bit. Like I feel a little bit bad because they're not a bad cricket team. This isn't like 36th in the world versus 80th in the world. I saw the Sydney Thunder collapse. It's very similar to that. Two very evenly matched teams, um, and it just went all wrong. They blocked out a few more overs. They got through the openers, who both took four for five and four for four, respectively, and then we brought on our leg spinner. He picks up the tail, as the, we like to call him the janitor, and before you know it, we're walking off, and it's 10 for 10, and I just still can't fathom how it happened. Good day, Corey. Jim Maxwell, here. nice to be chatting just to a, a familiar Aussie voice. Just a bit more about cricket in Spain. Is it locals? Yeah. Is it expats? Who's in the team? 
you got a mixed bag. So our captain, Christian Munoz Mills, is a Spaniard. Um, he looks after the fellas really, really well. We've got uh, a couple of South African and Australians that hold passports. And then we've obviously got uh, Pakistani and Indian origin players that are in the Barcelona area that, that fill up a lot of the team. I think the one nice thing about this Spanish side, we've got everyone speak Spanish um, besides myself. I know I like Omer Star, so I've got to keep learning a little bit more to catch up. But, um, yeah, a little bit you'll find in that associate level, you'll always have a little bit of here, there and everywhere um, to create a good good squad of 20 players. So it's growing quick, and uh, we've found a lot of good talent in the last 14 months. So how widespread is the interest in cricket? I mean, you mentioned cricket grounds. I mean, you've actually built cricket grounds in Spain. You're not just rolling out a mat on, a, on an open field. If you, uh, if you haven't had a chance to hear about Desert Springs in Almeria, it has ODI status. Uh, it's a turf wicket out in the desert where all the county teams come now and play all their pre-season matches. So we have a turf venue that's ready for ODI cricket. We're actually in talks with like Ireland and Scotland to come and play the first ever ODIs on Sc- uh, Spanish soil. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the European Cricket Network and the ECN. They play all their T10 in they, yeah, so I'm good friends with Daniel Weston. So they play all their T10 cricket in Cardama, which is up the road. And then we also have the facilities in Lamunga as well. That's where we played our series that usually have turf. It's a little bit behind at the moment because of the corona impact in Spain was quite severe. So we have to get more curators in. But Spanish cricket at the moment is this un, untapped resource of facilities, sun. And I think the ICC have recognised this now. And it is really starting to go upwards because we are now inviting teams all around the world to come and play on Spanish soil and to play on turf wickets. Well, that was Corey Rutgers, the head coach of the Spanish national team. And that just brings us to an end here on Stumped. Uh, Charu, Jim, fantastic to see you as always. And thank you so much for your time and for your company. Uh, Join us again next time on Stumped. Bye for now. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.